all stand as we celebrate before our Lord. Put your hands together. Let's sing, I will celebrate and sing unto the Lord. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Worshiping him, worshiping him. I will celebrate. I will celebrate. Sing unto the Lord. Sing to the Lord. A new song. I will celebrate. Sing unto the Lord. Sing to the Lord. A new song. Sing it again. Put your hands together. Down the mountain, the river flows. Down the mountain, the river flows. And it brings refreshing. We're well, through the valleys, through the valleys, and over the fields. The river is rushing, and the river is here.
Abundant life, the river of God, amen. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed how I love to proclaim. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed and mercy. His child and forever I am redeemed. Sing it out with you. seen his beauty. I know I shall see in his beauty. The king in whose law I delight. Oh, lovingly guided my foot and gave it me song. Come on, let's sing it out with me. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, 
please remain standing as Alfredo Rodriguez comes and lead us in our scripture reading. Familiar scripture today, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, if you want to turn there from the English Standard Version. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint me, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the power in it. We thank you, Lord, for the truths in it. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to grasp what it means to each of us personally and, Lord, what it means to us corporately. Lord, help us this day to remember those, Lord, who are hurting. Lord, as the anniversary of 9-11 comes up this Tuesday, help us, Lord, to be mindful of the firefighters, the police, and, Lord, of those who have lost loved ones and of those, Lord, who have lost innocence and hope because of the events of 9-11. Lord, please help us as your church to undertake, Lord, in ministering time and time again to these folks. And Lord, in our hour today, please touch our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of your presence. And then, Lord, help us to act upon what you say to us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you're getting seated, we welcome you to Calvary Chapel. If you did not get a bulletin when you came in, we trust and pray that uh, we'll get one to you. If you didn't get a bulletin, if you just slip up your hand and indicate that you're bulletin challenged. Any bulletin challenge? We don't want to say that you don't have a bulletin. That would be politically incorrect. But are you bulletin challenged today? Thank you, Sarah. If you, get, you can't always get a laugh out of everyone. I can count on her. But it costs me big time. <laughs> All right, everyone got, a, everyone got a bulletin? As soon as you get it, tear off that little end piece there. And uh, this is a place, if you're a guest, this is your first time, first time in a long time, to give us your name and address if you feel comfortable doing that. And on the back is the pl any prayer request that you might have or any need we might be able to help you with. Please check whether or not the prayer request would be appropriate for our prayer bulletin or if you would prefer that it be confidential. In just a moment, we're going to sing our welcome song. Jay, what's our welcome song today? Trading My Sorrows, Pastor. It's that bad. It's that bad. It's not right? you, Pastor. That's, that's not me. Are you sure? Are you sure? Um, I'll think about it. All right. How many of you went on vacation this summer? Do I have any vacation uh -huh. people? How far did, did anyone go out of the country this summer? Wow, you went out of the country. All right. So, so Mary Ann and Linda, you stand. Just stand for a second. So as the, as the music plays, everyone shake hands with Marianne and Linda and ask them to tell you about their trip, all right? So the music plays, all right? All right, let's all go. Marianne and Linda, how was your trip? Tell us all about it as the music plays. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. 
Mistakes are alive faster. Let's all stand for this song. And let's just put everything out of our minds but our Lord. Here I am to worship.
let's tell it that here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my, you're all together, Lord. You're all together, Lord. All together, worthy. All together, wonderful. Let's sing it again. Here I am. To see my sin upon that cross, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that. I'll never know. I'll never know how much it cost to see.
be seated. For the next three weeks, we will be working on a new series here at Calvary. I'm calling it Shepherdology. Well, and I believe it's an incredibly important series for both our church and our ministry here. Because of its importance, I'm a little bit nervous, feeling a little bit of pressure, feeling a lot inadequate. In some ways, I think I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to buy into something that maybe you don't want to buy into. So I wish today that somehow we could have a, a powerful marketing campaign. You know, maybe we could do something like Geico does, you know? You know, we could, we could talk about shepherdology, but, but do it with an Australian accent. Or, or, or maybe we could say shepherdology. It's as, it's as easy to understand, that it's so easy to understand that a caveman could understand it. Or, or maybe we could have people, you know, walking around with you about all the money we'll save with shepherdology, with the money and the dollars. Or, or maybe the, the, the pig could show, whee! Shepherdology is fun. But sadly, um, all these characters are busy with contractual obligations, so you're left uh, just hearing me today. Uh, maybe next week we can pull something off. What I want to share with our church family today is what I believe to be the very heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thus it should be our heart as his body, his visible representation on this earth. Today we want to talk about Jesus and his church and shepherding because everybody needs, together now, a shepherd. This is not new for us, but it's a concept that we often have trouble embracing. I've been praying for some time now that this concept will take hold in all of our lives. This morning we will be looking at Matthew 9, verse 35 through the beginning in chapter 10, we'll be seeing the method of Jesus' ministry, the motive for Jesus' ministry, the mandate in Jesus' ministry, and finally, the men from Jesus' ministry. But beyond all that, we'll see a shepherd and sheep and the huge need for shepherds for sheep. Of course, you're not stuck with me today as the salesman. With, without a slick marketing campaign, we'll simply have to listen to the voice of God as we see the example of Jesus and we'll have to ask the Holy Spirit to touch and move us. If we will open our hearts today, I am confident that the Lord will do amazing things in us and through us. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll look at Matthew chapter 9. Lord, please, in the next moments, help every one of us, Lord, to be open to hearing from you. Lord, you say, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, Lord, help me to hear, help these, my brothers and sisters, to hear loudly what you're saying to us. Because, Lord, sometimes, sometimes we, we don't listen so well. And please, Lord, make these truths real to us and help us, Lord, to apply them to our lives. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. When you get to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, you read about the method of our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. We read there that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. This is what Jesus did. He met people. Jesus spent time a lot of time with people. He traveled to population centers. If Jesus was here today, he would not spend all of his time in rural Pennsylvania on a farm. Jesus would spend his time in the cities with people. This was his modus operandi. This is how he always did it. He met with people. And that perhaps is the toughest thing about thinking about being involved in shepherding. Because the problem with shepherding is people. Someone has said, I don't mind ministry 
it's people I hate. How many of you have gotten involved in the life of a friend trying to help them and then wish you hadn't? Anyone here in the door? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Lily, two hands are not necessary, please. <laughs> I got the idea with one hand. It gets messy, doesn't it? And dealing with people can be very, very hard. Jesus also met needs. Intellectually, he was teaching the people. The Greek word there is didasko. So he, he gave them some intellectual food. And then spiritually, he was preaching to the people. He was proclaiming to the people. The Greek word there is caruso, where he was aiming at them spiritually. And then physically, he was involved in healing. He was meeting their physical needs. Therapeo is the word there, because it's tough to tell somebody about Jesus when they're hungry. Their attention is a little bit off. It's hard to tell somebody about Christ if they're in great pain and we don't first seek to help them with the pain. In reality, Jesus earned the right to be heard. He wasn't simply looking for spiritual scalps on the road to Jerusalem. He was looking to really genuinely help people because he loved them. As John Maxwell has said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When we simply meet people with a machine gun that we call Scripture and shoot them with as many Bible verses as we can, we often find that they're turned off and we wonder why. Because they're not sure we care. One person has said that Jesus Christ is God's missionary par excellence and he involves his followers in his mission. So there his disciples are there watching what he does. And then we find the motive for Jesus' ministry. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Note Jesus' response to the multitudes. He didn't run away from them. A little later, like we quoted last week, in John 4, 35, he tells his disciples, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. See people. See people. Don't see problems. See people. It says, when he saw them, he was moved by them. Splag chinzomai. Can we all say that together now? Splag chinzomai. Now you know Greek. Means to have pity on it or tenderness or to be moved in one's innards. You, you've had this feeling. You've been watching TV and a commercial has come on for save the children or something like that and they've shown you children in another part of the world starving or in great difficulty and it's touched you and, you, and you've reached for the phone or you've watched Jerry Lewis's uh, telephone, it's not his anymore, but you've watched it and you've, you've heard the stories and you've, you go, all right, all right, I, I'm going to give, I'm going to do something. You've been moved that way, but Jesus' movement was deep and it was real. And the reasoning about the multitudes is very simple. Jesus saw them. He was moved because they were harassed or weary. They're troubled. The Greek word there is skullo. And they were helpless or scattered. They're cast down. Like sheep having no shepherd. This may help you and I, because sometimes you see people, you see a lot of people, and they look to you to just be, let's be honest, stupid people. Jesus would see that crowd as sheep without a shepherd. As I've thought about this, really, for almost two years, I've asked myself over and over again, what does it mean 
to have the Lord as my shepherd or not to have the Lord as my shepherd. In other words, what does it look like to be a shepherdless sheep? What would that play out as? So I thought, the psalm that talks about the Lord being my shepherd is what? Psalm what? 23. So it would be the opposite of Psalm 23. So I compared the two realities. My reality, if I have the Lord as my shepherd, and then the shepherdless sheep's reality. This is how it plays out. I say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The one who is a shepherdless sheep says, without the Lord as my shepherd, all I know is need. All I know is need. The one with the Lord as their shepherd will say, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I'm provided for by my shepherd, both physically and spiritually. The shepherdless sheep can only say, I don't have his provision. And as a shepherdless sheep, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. I'm hurting. Did you ever wonder why people gravitate to some of the craziest teaching there possibly could be? You go like, man, why are you, why are you playing with pyramids? Why do you have crystals all over the place? This seems a little stupid. They're hungry, and they've got no shepherd. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The, the, the one who has the Lord as his shepherd would say, I'm led by my shepherd. When? All the time. Now, do I always follow his leading? No. But does he always give me direction? Yes. The shepherdless sheep would say, I don't have his path. And as a shepherdless sheep, I'm headless. I'm directionless. I have to read the horoscope every day and hope for the best. I can't wait to get into a Chinese restaurant. Maybe I'll get a fortune cookie at the end. Because that's all I have. One writer has said, sheep have a strong instinct to follow the sheep in front of them. When one sheep decides to go somewhere, the rest of the flock usually follows, even if it's not a good decision. For example, sheep will follow each other to slaughter. If one sheep jumps over a cliff, the others are likely to what? Follow. You say, nah, Dave, that sheep aren't that dumb. Really? from a 2008 article, excuse me, 2005, July 8th. 450 sheep jumped to their death in Turkey. First one sheep jumped to its death, then stunned Turkish shepherds who had left the herd to graze while they had breakfast, watched as nearly 15 others followed, each leaping off the same cliff. Turkish media reported that in the end, 450 dead animals lay on top of one another in a billowy white pile. Those who jumped later were saved as the pile got higher and higher and the fall more cushioned. <laughs> the sheep jumped. They followed. Those of you who have teenagers or who've had teenagers, you know this concept is true. Your teenager has done something stupid, and they've said everybody was doing it. And then you said, if everyone jumped off a cliff, would you? And then they stopped and thought about it. <laughs> well, how high is the cliff? <laughs> Does it look like something I could survive? Sadly, stupidity is not, there's not a monopoly on it by teenagers. 
People will rush to any crazy new movement. In herds, in herds, in herds. The newest medical discovery, the newest this, the newest that, in herds. Medians and psychics will make tons of money. Why? Shepherdless sheep. Isaiah 53, verse 6 reminds us like this of this. All we like sheep have what? Gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own. You know, sometimes we get arrogant and we say, oh, 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 no, 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 no. I would never be a stupid sheep. No, you were a stupid sheep. And you still have the potential to be a stupid sheep. Some of us have higher degrees in stupidity than others, but we all have stupid sheep on our name tag. That's what we are. Oh, no, 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 no. I would never be that way. I remind you that you didn't find God. God found you. As a sheep who had gone astray, he chased you down. You didn't run to him. You were running away. He had to come find you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm accompanied by my shepherd all the time. All the time. For the shepherdless sheep, I don't have his presence. And as a shepherdless sheep, I'm helpless. I'm helpless. I'm fallen and there's nobody to get me up but me. But me. The problem sometimes is we rely on others and then you, you get picked up by another person and then you both fall. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I am guarded by my shepherd all the time. Shepherdless sheep, I don't have his protection. And as a shepherdless sheep, I am harassed. I am hunted. There are ravenous wolves out to get me and tear me apart. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Whoa! No more grass. No more still waters. Forget that stuff. I'm in the house of the Lord forever. I have a promise of abundant life now and eternal life by my shepherd forever. As a shepherdless sheep, I don't have his promises. And I am hopeless. I am hopeless. I am hopeless. Sometime this year, I'll get a call from someone, or I'll get a call from a funeral director, and the conversation will go like this. On Tuesday at 10 a.m., can you do a funeral? Okay. For who? It's an older woman. She has nobody. Excuse me? Does she have a church affiliation? No. Does her family have a church affiliation? No. What do they have? Nothing. But they need someone to do a funeral. I'll do the funeral and then I'll sit in a room with a few people. I'll try to find a few nice words to say. But everyone is hopeless. And without the Lord as our shepherd, that's the state we're in. Hopeless. Hopeless. Zechariah tells us why this is all true. It says, For the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. In other words, the world's full of a bunch of lies. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a what? Shepherd. Why is it such a mess? Why are people such a mess? Is it because I'm smarter than them that I have not fallen for the same thing? No, 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 no. The only difference is I have a shepherd. That's the only difference. 
and the shepherd found me, I didn't even find him. Just another reminder, if you ever see a sheep on its back, lend a hand. A sheep can't get up from that position. That's, when, that's why Jesus said they were like sheep having no shepherd. He says they were cast down. They were on their back. When they're on their back, they can't get up. They can't physically get up. It's like human beings. We are fallen, and we on our own can't pull ourselves up. If you think you can pull yourself up, I am going to laugh and laugh and laugh because it's never going to happen. I need outside help, and so do you. A sheep can't get up from that position. If left on the back too long, it will eventually die. Psalm 49, 13, 14 reminds us of the ultimate destination of these shepherdless sheep. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people will prove of their boast. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. In other words, here's the reality. The only thing that's going to give them direction is death. When they die, whoo! Then they've got some direction. So hurting, headless, helpless, harassed, and hopeless. Who are those we should have compassion on? Please compare realities. When we have a need for something, where can we go? We can go to the Lord, can't we? Where can those without Christ go? There's nowhere to go. You see, our sin separates us from God, right? So because our sin separates us from God, even when we ask God for things, He does not always answer. He's not obligated to answer. Why? Because our sin comes between Him and us. But as those with Christ are forgiven, and when we have a need, we go to Him. When we want direction, where can we go to get it? Our shepherd. His word. Where can those without Christ get it? Well, they can, read, they can read the Bible. The Bible is a spiritually discerned book. If you don't have Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit in you, you can't understand it. While we're going through life, who do we have with us? We have the shepherd everywhere we go. Who do those without Christ have? In the midst of danger from without, who has our back all the time? Who makes it his business to rescue his stupid sheep? Our great shepherd. Our great shepherd. If I took a, a, a poll in this room and said, how many of you have done something stupid and the shepherd has rescued you? No, don't raise your hand. Let's just all raise our hands so we don't point everybody out, right? Yeah. Who has the back of those without Christ? When it is all said and done, what promises can we hold on to? What do those without Christ hold on to? There's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. I'll sit with people and they'll, 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 they'll tell me the, the craziest things. When we were at the, um, the, the motorcycle ride, there were, was there a woman there telling me the craziest things about how she had heard from a sister who'd gone beyond with some this, 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 and it's like, this is nuts. But it's all she had to hold on to. You know, a newspaper blew across my way that had a name that looked familiar. I know she's talking to me. That's all they have. If understanding what it's like to not have the Lord as your shepherd doesn't move us, we need to ask ourselves why. Why are we not moved with compassion? I suppose one thing can be stuff. The pursuit of possessions. 
we got to get this 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 to pay off this because we got that. So we have a crowded heart. And then there's speed. <laughs> the faster we go, the less we see. And how fast are we going? Whew. So we have a blurred heart. We run right by all those shepherdless sheep. Then there's sin. I care less and less and less because sin has hardened my heart. Perhaps for me, the one I identify most with is self. All my compassion is used up on one person, me. I have a selfish heart. You know, we have a number of moms with us today. I want to tell you, tell you all you moms are amazing people. Because if a mom gets sick and her children are sick, who's she worried about? Still her children. If I get sick and my kids get sick, let them fend for themselves. The important thing is me. It's one sip of medicine left, give it to me, man. I'm worried about those kids. Do I have a witness? Amen, yeah. Not about me, about yourself. Donald Miller said in his book, Blue Like Jazz, there are over six billion people in the world and I can only muster up enough concern for one, me. Jesus then moves to a mandate in his ministry. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus defines the problem. On the one hand, the harvest is great. The act of reaping could be unbelievably much. Could be a lot. On the other hand, there's a problem. What is the problem? The laborers are few. Small in quantity. Please note that the harvest is not the problem. The problem isn't that there are too many people or the people that we're trying to help come to Christ. The problem is not them. The problem is not that the harvest is too wicked, too cold, or too secular. When people found out years ago I was going to New York, or now when friends of mine hear that I'm pastoring New York, oh, oh, that's hard. New York is hard. New York is hard. Well, New York is hard, but it's not because of New Yorkers. The beauty of New Yorkers is they'll tell you where you stand right away. It, that's the beauty of New Yorkers. You're an idiot. Thank you. In the South, they'll couch it, oh, you know, in nicer words. Well, I don't know about that, brother. But here in New York, they'll tell you where to go and how to get there. Much easier in many ways, honestly. But the problem is not the harvest. The problem is the laborers. They're few. They're few because of disobedience. They're few because of apathy. They're few because of focus. And so there's this huge harvest. And no one, no one to bring the sheaves in. Jesus solves the problem. He says this. Because of this situation, pray, and the Greek word there is deomine, ask or beg the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, all of you are familiar with the, four, the three Greek words for send in the Greek language, right? There is pempo, which means to send. There is apostoleo, which we get our word apostle from, which also means to send. But then this little word here, ek balo. What does balo sound like? Ball. What do you do with a ball? You throw it. 
you, you can roll it. You throw it. Thank you, Judy. I remind you that this service is live, and now all of Staten Island knows about you. <laughs> the word ek means out. So Jesus says, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will throw out laborers into his harvest. He'll chuck them out. Why? Because they don't want to go. They don't want to go. I remind you that in the book of Acts, the first chapter and the eighth verse, Jesus said to his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Here's the thing. They didn't go. They didn't go. You know why? Because being in Jerusalem was so cool. The fellowship was unbelievable. I'd like to go, but Peter is preaching next week on how not to deny Christ, so I need to stay at least another week. Oh, no, no, no. John's going to talk about love. He's doing like a whole series. I think he's going to write a book, maybe, from the series, and I can't go. And besides that, you know, Mary, Jesus' mother, she's here. So if I have a question, what was Jesus like when he was a baby? He's right here. And then Thomas is going to do that apologetic series, how to deal with your doubts. How can I possibly leave? This is unbelievable here. The fellowships, we're breaking bread from house to house. I'm getting to know everybody so nicely. I'm not going to go anywhere. It's the best church in the world. It was also the only church in the world. So what happened? In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 4, we read these words. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Wait a second. Where were they supposed to go? Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. <gasps> they got ekbellowed. Except the apostles. Now those who were scattered went about doing what? Preaching the word. They had koinonitis. Koinonia means fellowship. They had fellowship disease. And God did radical surgery on the first church and sent them. Why? Because the world was in need of laborers for the harvest. Now, I need you to make a connection here. And it shouldn't be too hard, but I'm going to go slow. They were like sheep having no what? So Jesus prayed for laborers. What does he want the laborers to be? shepherds because everybody needs a shepherd the men from Jesus's ministry we read later that he called to himself his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them and he says to him, and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Now watch this last phrase. You received without paying, give without pay. King Jimmy says, freely you've been given, freely give. Jesus empowers them. He doesn't simply say, go. He says, go and I'll give you the power. I'll give you the right to do what you're supposed to do. He empowers them. But not only does he empower them, he expels them. He says, go. Those who pray get sent out. He expelled them to do what he did. As the Father has sent me, what? So send I you. And they were exhorted by Jesus. You received without paying. Give without pay. Freely you've been given. Freely give. 
I am a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, because in a really, really, really confusing church I was in, there was a Sunday school teacher named Percy Holmes, who was the only person in that church who knew the gospel, and he shared that gospel with me as a sixth grader. And his sharing of the gospel haunted me for two years until the summer of my eighth grade year in junior high when I got a Billy Graham decision magazine in the mail and I read it. Now, I don't know how Billy Graham got my name. I'm not even sure my name was on it. But I read it and it, it, it concerned me more and I went and talked to a high school football coach about what Billy Graham said and he, at the peril of losing his job, led me to Christ. All of that I got for free. And Percy Holmes and Billy Graham and Bob Ducart played a great part in it, but I was freely given it. I was a person without a shepherd. I cannot tell you how much trouble I was about to jump into. I was going to jump off the cliff like everyone else I knew. But God came after me. Freely I have been given. What is my obligation now? Freely give. Those people were shepherds in my life. I have an obligation now to shepherd others. And so do you, if that has been your experience. A guy named David Powelson wrote a very powerful, powerful anti-Psalm 23 so that we could understand what it means not to have the Lord as our shepherd. This is the psalm. I'm on my own. No one looks out for me or protects me. I experience a continual sense of need. Nothing's quite right. I'm always restless. I'm easily frustrated and often disappointed. It's a jungle. I feel overwhelmed. It's a desert. I'm thirsty. My soul feels broken, twisted, and stuck. I can't fix myself. I stumble down dark paths. Still I insist I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want it. But life's confusing. Why don't things ever really work out? I'm haunted by emptiness and futility, shadows of death. I feel the big hurt, and I fear the big hurt and final loss. Death is waiting for me at the end of every road, but I'd rather not think about that. I spend my life protecting myself. Bad things can happen. I find no lasting comfort. I'm alone, facing everything that could hurt me. Are my friends really friends? Other people use me for their own ends. I can't really trust anyone. No one has my back. No one is really for me except me. And I'm so much all about me, sometimes it's sickening. I belong to no one except myself. My cup is never quite full. I'm left empty. Disappointment follows me all the days of my life. Will I just be obliterated into nothingness? Will I be alone forever, homeless, free-falling into void? Sartre said hell is other people. I have to add hell is also myself. It's a living death. And then I die. If the Lord is not our shepherd, that's life. So, <laughs> do we care like Jesus? Are we moved with compassion by the multitudes? Are we moved by, with compassion for our neighbors? Are we moved with compassion for those we ride the ferry with, those we ride the express bus with? Are we moved? Do we share like Jesus? 
do we dare to be like Jesus? Will we be shepherds? Because what the world needs now more than anything else is shepherds. Is shepherds. The guy who led me to Christ, Bob Ducart, was fond of saying, taking a plane trip never made a missionary. We think of serving God and doing God's work. We go, oh, where could I go? Reminded that we have now the ministry of reconciliation. final two verses, probably three. Jesus tells us, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Why did the good shepherd have to lay down the life for, his life for the sheep? Because all we like sheep have gone what? Astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. See this beautiful, beautiful set of verses? Jesus gave his life for the sheep. Why? Because the sheep had gone astray. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now the sheep hear his voice, and they do what? They follow him. And he gives them what? Eternal life, and they never have to worry about perishing or have anyone pluck them out of his hand. They are his for how long? Forever. I'm proclaiming or encouraging or selling that everyone needs to be a shepherd. But that begins first and foremost by having the Lord as your shepherd. If you've never come to that place where you've turned your heart over to him, where you've acknowledged your sheepness and invited him, him in your life to save you and be your shepherd, then that is for you the first step. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, are you allowing him to be your shepherd? And then secondly, what this church always has to be about, what our lives have to be about, is chasing lost sheep. Chasing lost sheep. It's who we are. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for your word today. We're grateful for the truths contained in it. Lord, thank you for Percy Holmes and Billy Graham and Bob Ducart who brought me, Lord, who chased me as your instruments to bring me to you. Help me now, Lord, to chase others, to go after the lost sheep who need a shepherd. Help me, Lord, to have compassion on them and help me to lose my arrogance and my superiority thoughts that I'm not like them when, Lord, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Change my heart, O oh God. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, a very simple question for you. Do you know for sure the Lord is your shepherd?